The Tenant On Sunday, July 7th, 1895, Detective Geyer took his search to Toronto, where the city's police department assigned Detective Alf Cuddy to assist him. Together, Geyer and Cuddy scoured the hotels and boarding houses of Toronto, and after days of searching, found that here, too, Holmes had been moving three parties of travelers simultaneously. Holmes and Yoke had stayed at the Walker house, quote, G. Howe and wife Columbus, Mrs. Pitzell at the Union house, quote, Mrs. C. A. Adams and daughter Columbus, the girls at the Albion, quote, Alice and Nellie Canning, Detroit. No one remembered seeing Howard. Now, Geyer and Cuddy began searching the records of real estate agencies and contacting the owners of rental homes, but Toronto was far larger than any other city Geyer had searched. The task seemed impossible. On Monday morning, July 15th, he awoke facing the prospect of yet another day of mind-numbing routine. But when he arrived at headquarters, he found Det Detective Cuddy in an unusually good mood. A tip had come in that Cuddy found promising. A resident named Thomas Rives had read a description of Holmes in one of the city's newspapers and thought it sounded like a man who in October 1894 had rented the house next door to his, at 16 St. Vincent Street. Geyer was leery. The intensive press coverage of his mission and his arrival in Toronto had generated thousands of tips, all useless. Cuddy agreed that the latest tip was probably another wild goose chase, but at least it offered a change of pace. By now, Geyer was a national fascination, America's Sherlock Holmes. Reports of his travels appeared in newspapers throughout the country. In that day, the possibility that a man had killed three young children was still considered a horror well beyond the norm. There was something about Detective Geyer's lone search through the sweltering heat of that summer that captured everyone's imagination. He had become the first he had become the living representation of how men liked to think of themselves, one man doing an awful duty and doing it well, against the odds. Millions of people woke each morning, hoping to read in their newspapers that this staunch detective at last had found the missing children. Geyer paid little attention to his new celebrity. Nearly a month had passed since the start of his search, but what had he accomplished? Each new phase seemed only to raise new questions. Why had Holmes taken the children? Why had he engineered that contorted journey from city to city? What power did Holmes possess that gave him such control? There was something about Holmes that Geyer just did not understand. Every crime had a motive, but the force that propelled Holmes seemed to exist outside the world of Geyer's experience. He kept coming back to the same conclusion. Holmes was enjoying himself. He had arranged the insurance fraud for the money, but the rest of it was for fun. Holmes was testing his power to bend the lives of people. What irked Geyer most was that his central question was still unanswered. Where were the children now? The detectives found Thomas Rives to be a charming Scotsman of considerable age who welcomed them with enthusiasm. Rives explained why the renter next door had caught his attention. For one thing, he had arrived with little furniture, a mattress, an old bed, and an unusually large trunk. One afternoon, the tenant came to Rives' house to borrow a shovel, explaining that he wanted to dig a hole in the cellar for the storage of potatoes. He returned the shovel the next morning, and the following day removed the trunk from the house. Rives never saw him again. Detective Geyer, now galvanized, told Rives to meet him in front of the neighboring house in exactly one hour. Then he and Cuddy sped to the home of the realtor who had arranged the rental. With little preamble, Geyer showed her a photograph of Holmes. She recognized him instantly. He had been very handsome, with amazing blue eyes. Quote, this seemed too good to be true, Geyer wrote. He and Cuddy offered quick thanks and rushed back to St. Vincent Street. Rives was waiting outside. Now Geyer asked to borrow a shovel, and Rives returned with the same one he had let, lent the tenant.
The house was charming, with a steeply pitched central gable and scalloped trim like the gingerbread house in a fairy tale. Except this house sat not alone in a deep wood, but in the heart of Toronto on a fine street closely lined with elegant homes and yards fenced with fleur-de-lis pickets. Clematis in full bloom climbed one post of the veranda. The current tenant, a Mrs. J. Armbrust, answered the door. Rives introduced the detectives. Mrs. Armbrust led them inside. They entered a central hall that divided the house into halves of three rooms each. A stairwell led to the second floor. Geyer asked to see the cellar. Mrs. Armbrust led the detectives into the kitchen, where she lifted a sheet of oilcloth from the floor. A square trap door lay underneath. As the detectives opened it, the scent of moist earth drifted upward into the kitchen. The cellar was shallow but very dark. Mrs. Armbrust brought lamps. Geyer and Cuddy descended a steep set of steps, more ladder than stairway, into a small chamber about ten feet long by ten feet wide and only four feet high. The lamp shed a shifting orange light that exaggerated the detective's shadows. Hunched over, wary of the overhead beams, Geyer and Cuddy tested the ground with the spade. In the southwest corner, Geyer found a soft spot. The spade entered with disconcerting ease. Quote, only a slight hole had been made, Geyer said, when the gases burst forth and the stench was frightful. At three feet, they uncovered human bone. They summoned an undertaker named B.D. Humphrey to help recover the remains. Geyer and Cuddy gingerly climbed back down into the cellar. Humphrey leaped down. The stench now suffused the entire house. Mrs. Armbrust looked stricken. Then the coffins arrived. The undertaker's men put them in the kitchen. The children had been buried nude. Alice lay on her side, her head at the west end of the grave. Nellie lay face down, partially covering Alice. Her rich black hair, nicely plaited, lay along her back as neatly as if she had just combed it. The men spread a sheet on the cellar floor. They began with Nellie. We lifted her as gently as possible, Geyer said, but owing to the decomposed state of the body, the weight of her plaited hair hanging down her back pulled the scalp from her head. They discovered something else. Nellie's feet had been amputated. During the search of the residents that followed, police found no trace of them. At first this seemed a mystery, until Geyer recalled that Nellie was club-footed. Holmes had disposed of her feet to remove this distinctive clue to her identity. Mrs. Pitzel learned of the discovery of her girls by reading a morning newspaper. She had been visiting friends back in Chicago, and thus Geyer had been unable to telegraph the news to her directly. She caught a train to Toronto. Geyer met her at the station and took her to his hotel, the Rossen House. She was exhausted and sad and seemed perpetually near fainting. Geyer roused her with smelling salts. Geyer and Cuddy came for, the next, came for her the next afternoon to bring her to the morgue. They carried brandy and smelling salts. Geyer wrote, quote, I told her that it would be absolutely impossible for her to see anything but Alice's teeth and hair, and only the hair belonging to Nellie. This had a paralyzing effect upon her, and she almost fainted. The coroner's men did what they could to make the viewing as endurable as possible. They cleaned the flesh from Alice's skull and carefully polished her teeth, then covered her body with canvas. They laid paper over her face and cut a hole in the paper to expose only her teeth, just as the Philadelphia coroner had done for her father. They washed Nellie's hair and laid it carefully on the canvas that covered Alice's body. Cuddy and Geyer took positions on opposite sides of Mrs. Pitzel and led her into the dead house. She recognized Alice's teeth immediately. She turned to Geyer and asked, Where is Nellie? Only then did she notice Nellie's long black hair. The coroner, unable to find any marks of violence, theorized that Holmes had locked the girls in the big trunk then filled it with gas from a lamp valve. 
Indeed, when police found the trunk, they discovered a hole drilled through one side, covered with a makeshift patch. Quote, nothing could be more surprising, Geyer wrote, than the apparent ease with which Holmes murdered the two little girls in the very center of the city of Toronto, without arousing the least suspicion of a single person there. If not for Graham's decision to send him on his search, he believed, quote, these murders would never have been discovered, and Mrs. Pitzel would have gone to her grave without knowing whether her children were alive or dead. For Geyer, finding the girls was, quote, one of the most satisfactory events of my life. But his satisfaction was tempered by the fact that Howard remained missing. Mrs. Pitzel refused to believe Howard was dead. She, quote, clung fondly to the hope that he would ultimately be found alive. Even Geyer found himself hoping that in this one case, Holmes had not lied and had done exactly what he had told the clerk in Indianapolis. Quote, had Howard been placed in some institution, as Holmes had intimated his intention of doing, or was he hidden in some obscure place beyond reach or discovery? Was he alive or dead? I was puzzled, nonplussed, and groping in the dark. 